you feel the trick. <laughs> so, it's a trap. Yes, it's a trap. <laughs> so tonight's lecture, you know, you go to a lot of decompression lectures, and it's always about, you know, how are you going to get hurt? Um, how fast should you follow your algorithm? Whether a bubble's going to get you or not? All that good stuff. And, and the causes of decompression sickness is what we focus on an awful lot when we're going over decompression information. It's pretty logical. But tonight, um, we're not going to be doing that at all. Uh, this lecture explores the following question. Is a human being capable of diving a specific decompression algorithm? Now, it doesn't matter whether you're a no decompression diver and you're following God, I hope you're not using tables, but if you are, the, the tables they gave you in class, uh, or you're following your dive computer, or if you're a decompression diver and you're following, usually you're following a forecaster, you're planning with a forecaster, and you're also following a dive computer in the water, sometimes tables. Um, if you're as old as Jeff, you, uh, he's still doing tables, I think, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but specifically, it's not just about whether or not you're capable of diving a decompression algorithm. Can you do it within reasonable proximity on any one specific dive? And even more importantly, what's the likelihood that you're actually repeating that? Most people are under the impression that they're pretty darn close, and I have it in writing. So, um, and that's okay. Maybe you might feel differently by the end of the lecture. Um, we're going to say. So. If we were to jump in the water and swim down to 50 feet and stay down there for two and then swim back to the surface, how much decompression time would we need to do before we could come to the surface? Feels like a trick question. None, right? We can go to the bottom, go down to 50 feet, and we can come right back to the surface. How come? OK. So we haven't loaded that much inert gas at least enough that prevents us from coming to the surface without having to stop first, okay? We don't, our last stop is on the surface and there isn't so much in our body that we're, prov we're required to stop deeper in order to let some of it out before we come to the surface. That makes sense? Okay. And what's the likelihood of getting bent on a no decompression dive like that versus a two-hour decompression dive. Probably the first example is not a very good one, going to 50 feet for a minute and coming back. But on a normal decompression dive versus standard going out, diving a reef, going to 50 feet, going to 75 feet, and coming back up, the, the likelihood of getting bent isn't any greater. But people feel that with greater exposure to decompression stress, we increase the likelihood of getting bent. And that's not, that really hasn't been documented very well. But our intuitive logic always brings us there, right? We just follow that logic. The more decompression, the, more, the deeper we go, the longer we stay, the more likely we are to have an incident. Not necessarily true. So for any of you who haven't trained with me before, your, my artwork is amazing. So for those of you who have, you can say, oh my god, here it is again. So um, just pretend that that's a tissue compartment. And what happens when we're breathing gas under increased pressure 
what happens to the inert gas, the nitrogen and sometimes the helium that we're breathing? It transfers, right? It moves and it starts to collect in our tissues. So how come it transfers? Wherever there's greater pressure and there's less pressure, you're going to have a movement, right? So this inert gas collects, travels into our tissue compartments. And while we're down there, it's just kind of collecting. But there's a very important point that people miss, and we're going to touch on this several times, is even though we're at the bottom and we're just collecting, it's already leaving, some of it. Most people feel it's either going in or coming out. And that leads us to a lot of poor conclusions when we start thinking about decompression. Okay? There's always a transfer of in and out. It's just in different percentages. So as this begins to collect and this tissue compartment fills up, what's increasing? The pressure in the tissue compartment, right? So as we begin to rise, does the surrounding pressure around that tissue, does it increase or decrease? Decreases, right? Ambient pressure drops. And so what happens, there's greater pressure at some point in the tissue compartment inside of it than on the outside. And what happens from there? Begins off-gassing. So off-gassing is also referred to as supersaturation. Okay, the bubbles start working their way out. To uh, show off my artistic ability, I'm going to put in this wheel, and that wheel is designed to open and close that tissue compartment. And by opening and closing that tissue compartment, we're able to allow more gas to release. Okay? And the way that we do that, the control that we use to control off-gassing. Ambient pressure. Ambient pressure is used to control the off-gassing in that tissue compartment. Um, I promise it'll get better. We gotta get through this point. Everyone got coffee? Yes. So as it happens, this gas is releasing and we're trying to control it. So why do we need to control it? It has been proven that if it if we off gas too quickly, we can be we can get injured. Okay? And the more off-gassing that occurs, at some point there's a threshold we don't want to go beyond. Okay? We're not going to get deep into the mechanics of algorithms and how they work, but we have to discuss, if we're going to talk about whether or not we can replicate an, uh, an algorithm underwater, we have to understand how they work a little bit. So we're going to get into a few of those points. We're going to talk about how we manage gas moving in and out of these tissues, okay? So what are the more popular models that we have when it comes to controlling off-gassing? Bowman. Bowman. We've got some, we've got BPM, RGBM, RGBM lots of neat initials, right? <laughs> So these great initials um, are designed to help manage this. And they do it typically across 16 theoretical tissue compartments. Now, everybody understands, every single diver out there understands that decompression theory and the models that we use are theoretical. But we're going to challenge that a little bit tonight because in most cases, one of the reasons why we get so specific and we drill down into some of this information 
a little too seriously is because we actually start to make it real. Okay? I'll show you what I mean to that in a little while. We really do forget that this is just theory. And I'm gonna, I'll explain to you why further. So when we have different models, are they really much different than one another? Do you feel there's a huge difference between diving a Bullman model or gradient factors or versus VPM or RGBM or any other initials? You know, they really are, and I think, I think the more time you spend looking at them, I think everyone kind of finally, most of the time, comes to that going, boy, you'll find some people that are pretty passionate about, you better not dive that model or you're going to die, right? You know, you get that all the time, you're going to die. Um, but, you know, when you start taking a look at it, they are pretty close. Um, do you feel selecting a model influences your safety? No? So how come you're diving the one that you're diving? Okay, got it from instructor? Those damn instructors. <laughs> okay. Lance? Marketing. I mean, I started out with oceanic computers. Yeah. Sure. So marketing, some, some computers are a little friendlier than others, right? They give you a little more bottom time, especially for no decompression divers. That means a lot. It's friendlier, gives me a little more bottom time. I like that. Well, there's research behind, you know, especially models. Yes. Sure. Some models here are, you know, so some of them are Bowman fine fetch Yes. What's the, what's the foundation for all dive computer models to begin with for their algorithms? All of them. The first dive computer came about because of Bielman's work, but literally all of them are a variation of Bielman. Okay? So they really don't stray too far from them. There are some proprietary, you talk to the guys at Oceanic, and they have some proprietary additions, which is always scary because they never want to tell you what that really is. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter much anyway. But, um, do you, do you feel you actually dive that model? It is putting you on a theoretical model, and do you feel you dive close to it? Uh, I think something we'll do with the Pico stuff where you compare two models, you can see where you might have got longer in one point than another one. So okay. Speak very, you, yes, it's close, but you do see the difference. Okay, so you think there's subtle variations? You can see a difference on the curve of, this, of your Pico model on the, on the screen. Right? Yes, okay. Um, I take it everybody's pretty satisfied with the results, so they probably wouldn't be diving. <laughs> okay. Um, what area of the dive does your computer really control? Your ascent, right? It's about, you come down, we do our dive, and somehow, you're going to make some type of an ascent. And it's usually controlled to a certain aspect, whether it's your 15-foot, three-minute safety stop, or it's decompression stops throughout the way. You're going to follow some kind of a model. And the model is basically most important from the point of when you leave the bottom to you you get to what is called your first stop, okay? And then it manages it throughout the rest of that all the way to the surface. That's the intent of the theory, okay? So it's good that we have that. Sean, can we throw uh, this up on the screen? On the projector? Technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, there it is. It's still pretty light. All right, so let's, let's talk about if we're doing a no decompression dive. No deco. But we're diving a computer that is, for those of you who are familiar with Buhlmann's variation called gradient factors, it's probably one of the more popular models out there. Shearwater predominantly uses that. How many people in here are diving shearwater? You guys feel a little left out? <laughs> We've got them in the back. You can take one with you. OK? So that was a setup. <laughs> yes. So we're going to talk about a no decompression dive. And let's pretend there are two divers. They both dove the same profile. <laughs> and one of them is set his gradient factors to a 3070, and the other one has set to a 9090 gradient factor. Okay. That one will always get a lot of insults. Right. I know that. Um, so, who's going to get more bottom time? 90-90. So what do I mean by that question? Who's going to be able to stay there longer? The person with a less aggressive, a more conservative profile can't stay as long, right? OK. So here's my first, it's a real subtle one, but it's the first example, the difference between theory and reality. OK. The theory is you are all if that's what your answer is, absolutely correct. The reality is the difference between these two values will literally evaporate during the ascent. So there is no difference in your time, your time to surface, or your values whatsoever. It's so minute, so minuscule, it probably is less than seconds. OK? But what's that? If you could even do it, good for you. OK? Show off. Oh. <laughs> Just smarty pants. So, um, so, you know, I've seen, I actually put this together because I saw a very big thread on uh, one of those diving forums, and uh, people were talking about this, and really well-known mixed gas instructor trainers, these are guys that know a lot about decompression, they're well-trained from the training agencies, they were all stating that you should slow your GFs down, even as a no decompression diver, because it matters. It's intuitive logic that doesn't play in real life, okay? It doesn't matter. GFs, VPM, RGBM, only come into play once you cross the threshold of no decompression, period. Just the way it is. You can add factors, and that's what a lot of the no decompression diving computers do. They will add factors that will take away some of your bottom time uh, to be more conservative, OK? And they might have settings of like one, two, three, four, five. But even those actually typically evaporate just due to the, the pressure transfer that takes place. When you, what you're saying, let's just say they were set to the maximum Buhlmann off-gassing value of a 1.58 pressure differential between the inside and the outside. When you hit that, that's when you'd go into decompression. Well, when you're right on the line of hitting that and you begin your ascent, it all evaporates just like that. Okay? You ever see your NDL time just skyrocket as soon as you leave the bottom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think happens to all of that? Okay? So that's my first point. So we'll talk about what happens when you cross that threshold. Um, when you go into decompression diving, it requires a subsurface stop to allow for off-gassing 
and to reduce supersaturation. Remember we were talking about this tissue compartment that released gas? Well, once you reach a threshold of you can't have that little ambient pressure on the outside of it or too much gas is going to release, we stop deeper. And typically your computer will stop you at 10 feet or 3 meters for your first stop. It's going to hold you there until your theoretical tissue compartments calm down a little bit off gas and then it'll allow you to go to the surface. And it's going to keep you under a particular threshold even once you get to the surface. Okay? So a GF can be applied to this type of a dive, but boy, short 15, 20 minute decompression dives with a manipulation of an algorithm of conservatisms, changing to one GF to another, you got to do the math, but they don't play out very differently, even if you could execute them. So, as we talked about before, in decompression dives, inert gas pressure is absorbed during the dive, and the dive dictates if stops are required before you surface. And the result is a virtual overhead environment, and that's maintaining and controlling the supersaturation. So, Everyone heard of Haldane before? Well, I bet a lot of the recreational divers haven't. So Haldane's given all the credit, but actually it was um, Burt in the uh, late 1800s that came up with uh, the idea of bubbles. And Haldane per perfected them in the early 1900s. And he was carrying about five theoretical compartments and what Haldane, his primary theory said across five theoretical tissue compartments that none of them could have twice the pressure between the inside and the outside of the pressure, uh, of the, the tissue compartment, any of them. Whichever one released got to the point of twice the pressure differential, that's where he'd, he'd, call it, he'd stop you right there. And he'd want to control the off-gassing until that pressure dropped below that point, And then he'd allow you to come up a little bit more. And he said two times was just right. The interesting thing is, along the way, and this is going on till this day, um, there were a lot of people out there diving very what we consider to be unconventional models. And they had much deeper stops than Haldane. They were doing a lot of different things and they were achieving good results. But most of it was anecdotal. Uh, they didn't have good controls and it really wasn't studied too well. And when we talk about models, we have basically two types of models. One is called dissolved gas, the other is a gas phase model. Um, some people like to call these bubble models because they deal a lot with micro bubbles. But actually, all models are bubble models. And Haldane was two and a half, was saying a pressure difference of twice. And why is it called dissolved gas? Gas goes in, it dissolves on the way out, right? And controlling how it dissolves is what the model is designed to do. So Bowman came along, and after that came gradient factors. Some of you may have heard of VGM, but uh, whoa. Are you guys playing with the buttons? Didn't your parents teach you not to do that? So, and then somewhere along the way, we came out with some gas phase models, and we 
were introduced to VPM and RGBM. People got really excited about, there's more buttons. Okay. <laughs> so the, the primary thing about a dissolved gas model is it's more of inner gases in your breathing gas dissolve into the diver's tissue and then has to work their way back out. And he's trying to control that. So gas phase models, believe it or not, VPM and RGBM, their primary, their, their, the basis of the model is a dissolved gas model. It is Bowman's work. They just added something to it. Okay? So in every VPM model and all the RGBMs, they're still based on Bowman to begin with. Okay? And it's important to keep those ideas in mind. There's why was there lots of debate? I mean, I think decompression in what Type of model and whether or not you're safe or you're a lunatic yeah. is a very passionate subject. You guys remember the huge thread on Rebreather World? There were like 95,000 views, hundreds of posts, and it was all on just deep stops and aspect. And I'll tell you what, some of the best minds that we have today were participating in that thread <laughs> and some of the worst were also participating <laughs> and we had to delete all their crap okay because <laughs> it was bad so um, but it was a very passionate debate um, it's a lot like politics today where everyone's kind of completely nutso on one side or another same thing with decompression it's incredibly passionate and the interesting thing is how much scientific proof is behind it? So over the years, as we've progressed from Haldane's work into Bowman's into these modified Bowman models, have we accomplished anything? Has the incident rate gone down? Man, are you right? What's what's the incident rate of a decompression head? Anyone know the numbers? A little bit easier to understand. You're not far off. His, his, they they vary, unfortunately, like a lot of things. But the best numbers we have is probably anywhere between. In every ten thousand dives, there's between one and nine hits, depending on how you want to look at it. Okay. It's pretty low. But then we have to take into account what's a hit. Well, a hit is technically whenever they fire up a chamber, which means every time they turn on a cash register. OK, an insurance company. Um, and you know, in all fairness, when someone gets hurt diving, we do put them in a chamber a lot because it's probably not going to harm them to do that, and we're not really sure. So. But did they, was it really an incident? Probably, it's pretty safe to say, a much lower percentage are actually real incidents. And then we have to break down what's an incident. I mean, is it a shark attack? No. Most of it is skin bends, joint pain. Some people experience some really painful results and stay in it for days and go through some really, really bad uh, episodes. Few people actually die from it. But people talk about it as if any hit is a death sentence. <laughs> and I think that's where people really start to go wrong with things. We have to consider, is it the biggest problem that we have in diving? Um, Lance, you said it best. It's, I mean, it's very low. And you know what? There are so many more things going on that you need to be worried about other than decompression. 
but everybody loves this one the most. Why do you think that might be? Can someone please tell me? <laughs> tell me. Yeah, well, everybody gets to be an expert because nobody's got the answers. Um, everybody's concerned about it. I think for the most part, everybody wants to be a safe diver. And divers tend to attract control freaks, maybe? Not me. So they want to control it. They want to be good at it. They want to be safe. And they want everybody around them to do it just like them, right? And so that's where a lot of this comes from. And boy, I wish we could be more precise about it. Um, but you know, the Bullman model is backed by evidence. Bullman's work is kind of the holy grail of uh, decompression theory. And Bullman came up with the higher pressure difference in what he called his M value. If you remember, Haldane said it was two times, twice pressure difference. Bullman came up with 1.58. Not 5.6, it's 5.8, right? And so all of his theoretical tissue compartments, when you're rising, he's trying to keep you on any of them under a 1.58 pressure differential from the inside of the tissue to the outside of the tissue. And that keeps the off-gassing level down to what he considered to be a safe level. Um, The higher the pressure difference from his end value, as you go beyond it, it increased the likelihood of having an event. An event, a bad event, <laughs> a good event. Um, has there been any proof that diving less than Bielman's M value leads to less and fewer events? Any evidence? Is diving a 37 better than the 90-90 we were talking about? Are there fewer incident rates? You know, if you're keeping up on the most uh, modern stuff that's out there, they're actually starting to show a lot of evidence that these really slow profiles are leading to higher incident rates. So how can that be if there's a line and we do less than the line, and the further away we get from that line, we should be safer. We should be, what's the word? Conservative, right? Are we? Remember when I said to you guys very in the very beginning, we talked about tissues, and tissues load and unload at the same time. The reason that the intuitive logic falls into play with people for the most part, that if there's a line and I'm less than that line, that means I'm creating less stress and I'm safer and more conservative, is thinking that when I'm going up, all I'm doing is off-gassing. It's a very flawed perspective because people fail to give credit to and to recognize that during your ascent, you are loading far more than you're ever taking into account in your intuitive logic. Okay? And we're going to get into a little example of that in a little while. Primary difference with Haldane and Buhlmann's models is they didn't take into account type one and type two DCS. It was just kind of a broad stroke across the board whether or not we had an event. Do we know the difference between type one and type two? Men versus men. Yeah, close, tack. Okay, so what's a type one? That's more type one. Joint pain. 
Neurological is type 2. And neurological typically comes about from tiny bubbles making it through the heart to the other side and hitting, yes, hitting your central nervous system, um, your brain if you have one. Um, <laughs> sorry. And uh, spinal cord, that, that general area. And those are typically, when they do happen, those are probably the, the least enjoyable, right? So what happened is, in the 70s, they started to take a look at our models, specifically Bielman's model, and they were saying, we think we can do better, which is great. We should always want to do better. And they felt that this broad stroke that was taking into account and covering just an incident rate, if we control the model in this way, overall the incident rate is reasonable. They said, you know, if we can get a little more specific, we can then control things a little bit better and we can have a better result. So, I think, yeah. You guys have this seared into your brain? I don't wanna, yeah, okay. So if we have a typical ascent profile, and say that's a Buhlmann ascent, What they were saying is, overall, this gave us a reasonable result. But they were really concerned about type 2 hits, tiny micro bubbles making it across to the other side that were so tiny, even during that initial off-gassing phase, they were able to jump across the other side of your heart and cause a problem. And they said, you know what? we need to control those a little better. And if we can control those better, we may not have to over allow so much with the big bubbles on the top end. So this started to put an interesting idea in things because it says, hey, you know what? If we slow down in the bottom end, trying to control those micro bubbles a little bit more, Just slowing the ascent a little bit, controlling that end of it. We may not have to go so slow all the way through the top. Because remember, Buhlmann was just a broad stroke. That's how they were looking at it. And by being more precise on the bottom, they were then able to, and the idea was, you didn't have to over allow in the top end, it wasn't all about shallow stop decompression. Slowing down a little bit on the deeper end would allow you to move through the mid-range and the, in the shallow range faster and actually get out of the water sooner. So the premise was, hey, we can dive the same dive, control our ascent a little more during the bottom, and actually get out of the water sooner and have a better result, okay? I got a good friend of mine, the guy that designed True Dive for me, that he is an RGBM, I call him a priest, okay? When I spend time with him, I'll walk out of wherever I was with him and I'm convinced RGBM is, and then I realize after I leave the room, my God, what did he do to my head, right? But he will convince you that these models are superior, that if you're not diving them, you're crazy, and you're going to die, right? <laughs> and he'll explain why, and he's got evidence. But you know, there's a lot of assumptions that are built into that evidence along the way. God, shut it off. <laughs> um, and that creates a little bit of a problem, because if these profiles really aren't better, then what have we accomplished? So we've had these models out for years now. And there are people that are passionately following one or the other. 
and the results have been, do we have any results? Actually, the dives look more like this. Everybody comes up slower and goes longer. Anyway, it didn't deliver what Again, just like politics. And yet everyone keeps looking to go slower and slower and slower. And have we anything? If you talk to anyone right now and said, pure Bullman, how would most people feel about that? Have a heart attack. Right. Well, there isn't any, any evidence to suggest diving any less than Bielman's line. Any less. You're less likely to get an incident. There is reasonable ev evidence to show as you go, and by the way, it's not a line like you blow up when you cross it, okay? Still an extremely low incident rate even as you exceed it, okay? But when you go over the line, you will increase your likelihood of getting back. That is, there's reasonable evidence to support that. There is not reasonable evidence to support Diving slower than Bullman reduces your incident rate. And now there is evidence showing. Have you watched uh, Decompression Controversies by Simon Mitchell? That's a pretty powerful one. Showing that these slower profiles are actually increasing the incident rate. So maybe too much of a good thing, even if it wasn't a good thing in the first place. Something to consider. But the whole interesting point to all of this is that people are very and very adamant about the idea of what they think is safe. And it's based on almost no evidence. It is purely emotional. And here's the fun you may not be diving anything that you think you're diving. So, everyone doing okay or do we need to take a short break? Tack needs a beer. Tack needs a beer. Tack needs a beer. All right, a beer is coming. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit about gradient factors. I'm going to use gradient factors as uh, just a short presentation on it as how we control an ascent and what goes into those controls. Because where we're going to be going from here in a little while is are we actually able to do those things? And what are some of the factors that are being put into it that we don't even know about, we haven't considered? And what are the factors that we're not controlling at all that are there? So if we look at one little model briefly, it'll help us to understand the rest of them because it's the same stuff. So we're going to talk about gradient factors because people more often than not um, use gradient factors. It's probably the more popular one out there. That looks better. <laughs> so. What are gradient factors? What, why are they used to modify the Bullman model? Well, what they decided to do is tweak the dissolved gas model to act more like RGBM and VPM. In other words, it was introducing that dual modeling idea. This is service. The highest educated person here is delivering beer. <laughs> isn't, isn't that the way of things? Yes. So. Um, so what does it do? It, it tweaks a, a dissolved gas model to resemble more like VPM or RGVM. It creates a, a dual model. It adds deeper stops. It extends the shallower time. And is it a, an additional conservatism? God, everybody swears it is. 
but sorry, there's no proof of that. And uh, forecasts pressure differences between tissues and ambient pressure to create a schedule. So let's talk about it. What's the low and the, there's low and a high number. There's a 30 and an 85, or there's a 90 and a 90. There's all these numbers. And what are they? The low number is a percentage of pressure difference. Did we do something? Oh, is it maybe battery low? Anyway, uh, the percentage of uh, pressure difference between theoretical tissue compartment and ambient pressure. So Buhlman had his M value, which was a 1.58 pressure differential. And he would stop you, your first stop, way up here at that 1.58 pressure differential. If you're running, say, 3085, you're going to stop at 30% of your 1.58 pressure differential. Deep stop. You're going to stop deeper. You're going to continue to load more. And you're going to follow an arc that slowly allows you to release up to 85%. of Bowman's value versus 100%. So he's keeping you less than the line. He's controlling the off-gassing more, but, he's also, but you're also loading a lot more along the way. So it takes longer. If you load it, you have to unload it, OK? So this is not me. There we go. So, <laughs> so the low number and the high number represent a percentage of Buhlmann's 1.58 pressure differential. Low number being where your first stop is, high number being where your last stop is, and percentage to that. So normally when you look at pressure information scientifically, when pressure drops, it goes like this, right? But we're divers. So I didn't like that very much, so I did it my way. And that is pressure drops when you go up. So here's the non-scientific look at a pressure difference. And here's Buhlmann's line. Here's ambient pressure. You leave the bottom, and you would stop at 100% of his 1.58 pressure differential. But you know what? This is a 30 percentile. So you're going to go to one third. And you're going to travel along and off gas, keeping it progressively increases up to 85% until your computer clears. So there's a lot more loading going on along the way, a lot less off gassing. It takes you longer to get there which isn't a problem, but what's going on needs to be taken into account. So that's how gradient factors work. Uh, one of the things that we fail to recognize is that we typically follow models in 10-foot patterns, right? So we go to 70 feet, 60 feet, 50 feet, 40 feet, so on. You are automatically skewing your, great, your pressure differentials right there. You have just left the model. You have never were there in the first place, but now you've really left it. You're completely off the reservation as you start doing this. The model follows a more linear value. And as you stay at 70 feet for three minutes, when you should have been going 70, 66, 64, 61, that whole time maintaining that pressure differential right on the line, you're loading more. And then you have to unload that. And the arc just keeps going. Right? Sound effects help, right?
<laughs> yes, yes. Miss, miss Pico stuff. So key concepts as gas moves from high to low pressure, no off-gassing unless tissue pressure is greater than ambient. So we have to have a pressure differential in order for it to move. Represent a, a percentage of ambient pressure. And that's that blue line. There's our M value. That's a 1.58 pressure differential inside, outside of the tissue compartment. And there's a 3085 representation. So what do we need to do in order to execute a factor model? Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to swim 30 feet per minute oops, from the bottom to our first stop, whatever that may be. How many people in here have taken a class here at Helium? Did uh, swimming, every, most everyone thought they were swimming 30 feet per minute until we made you do it. Kind of surprising. Do you still do that on every dive? No. Who the hell wants to? But when you talk to most people, they're under the impression, yeah, swimming 30 feet a minute. We all do that to our first stop. And you have to think about that. That's 30 feet this way. Lines and marker buoys and everything are laid out like this, in order to, carry, to run feet, you're going to, you're going to carry some space. Steve, you're going to love it. You're next. <laughs> they start their class on Sunday. So in addition to that, all your stops have to be held at required depths. All stop times must be executed as planned. Um, your total time to service implies a 10-foot stop pattern. But that doesn't mean that by following your 10-foot stop pattern that you are maintaining your algorithm. That means you're leaving it. True GF does not include 10-foot stop pattern. That's why, for those of you that dive a shearwater computer and it has that wonderful thing called drilling, that is your true algorithm depth. So are most of us actually diving the GF we plan for? If you're not feeling that that's a trick question yet, you ought to. Okay. We're not, and we're going to get into why. Um, big what are we diving? And how might this affect the outcome of our dives? Let's, let's throw a little question out. Let's imagine that, that we weren't even anywhere near close to our model. I know you're pretty sure, and you're probably right. But just for argument's sake, what if you weren't anywhere near close to the model that you think you're diving. And nobody else was either. What was the incident rate again? Nine or 10 and 10,000. And even then? Makes you start to wonder if that first premise is even remotely true. These models may not have much value. Before we go there, I'm going to make a point. Tack swims to 300 feet, and he stays there for an hour. Where is he? Where is he? Oh, we're, we're definitely going to. And he suddenly realizes that the boat is probably going to leave without him. Again, and so <laughs> tack drive 
runs straight to the surface. What happens to tack? De dead tack. Yes. <laughs> OK. So we know this is true. <laughs> need to explore your possibilities. But the chances are you're not going to do well on a dive like this. How come? Yeah, OK. It's explosive. So when you really grossly exceed the values, what gets you? The bubbles get you, or rip you apart, OK? So what they've been trying to prove for years is when you go out and you dive a relatively sane profile, and you dive the same goddamn profile for 10 years on the same wreck, you do the same thing every time, and then you get bent one day. What they're trying to tell you, what, they, what they've been trying to put together is, since it happens here, the same thing that caused that caused this. The bubbles got you. Even though you've done it hundreds and hundreds of times, and you bubbled every damn time you dove, this time it got you. And what do we call it? An unheard, an unearned hit, right? The real The real thing that's going on in decompression research is they've finally stopped trying to blame this because of that. But man, it would have been great if they were right, don't you think? And it's intuitive. It makes sense. This is where it is, and sometimes we just get a little too close to it, and it bites us. It would be great if it was that simple, but it's not. But we still try and turn it into this. And what happens to every diver that gets bent? First of all, they tell you not to dive for three months, which is interesting. The other one is all their friends will tell them, it's your model. You need to slow down. Oh my god, you didn't talk to Peter Sotis, did you? <laughs> not him, right? You need to slow it down. If you're diving a 3085, you might try a 3075. Interesting that that's where people go. So let's talk about what happens with on gassing and off gassing. We're into talking about four divers. They all entered the water at the same time, and they are perfectly. They're at the exact same depth. They're dropping at the same speed. It's like Bap and Jeff diving together. It's like perfect symmetry. <laughs> Till Tack comes along. And, uh, and by the way, all four of these divers think differently, and they've all selected four different gradient factor models, conservatisms. One's a 90-90, one's a 50-90, one's a 30-90, one's a 10-90. Can you tell me what they all have in common? Yes, they're all going to get out of the water with the same loading. That's when they're going to clear. What may be different is their ascent speed and the amount of gas they load in relation to what they will then need to offload. So as they continue along, and they get to the deepest, furthest part of the dive right here, and they're still perfectly together, they, they all have the same amount of loading. They've all loaded the same amount of gas according to their model. Okay. Well, no? How come? In, in what way? I mean, you know, my sack rate is also changed so much nitrogen I'm not pulling in. So right. I'm going to assume more gas than her. We're going to have a little difference. 
Well, you're right in some ways, but not for the reasons you think. Your sack rate doesn't affect your, 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 your quantity of loading. What, what loads the inner gas that loads into your system, you may need a certain amount of volume to operate, but that doesn't turn into more additional inner gas loading and unloading into your tissues. Okay. So, but for the, you're right in a way, and I'll get back to you on this and be able to show you where you're right. And in some ways, not exactly right, but you're on to something. Sorry. <laughs> it's fun when you can do that to somebody. So they're all together. So what happens when they begin their ascent? The 9090 diver is already moving up a lot faster and has loaded less gas. Now they all left the bottom with the exact same amount of loading. Okay? The, the model itself counts for a certain amount of loading for depth and time. That's the way it is. And as they continue up the profile, Remember, they're all diving their profile perfectly. They're doing 30 foot per minute ascents. They're holding all their stops. And what's happening to, you know, there's a big difference between the 1090 and the 9090 diver, right? By the way, this isn't reality, it's just a presentation. So it would be much bigger spread, actually. But it's pretty clear to see what's happening is the faster profile has loaded less and therefore allows him to clear and get out of the water much sooner with the exact same amount of tissue loading as these other divers. How come? It's true because he came up faster, so he loaded less. If you don't load it, you don't need to put it. Now, most divers that are conservative, that, re that recommend going slower, they look at this diver and say, he's skipping, he's omitting decompression penalties as if he's just skipping it. But if you don't absorb it, you don't need to release it. And the reason for that, remember I was talking to you about loading and unloading going on at the same time all the time, just in different percentages. That's what's happening here. So depending on what you select and depending on what your philosophy is, the interesting part is nobody's omitting decompression stress or requirements. They're just, they're just loading less. Some, some of them are loading less than others and therefore don't need to unload it and can get out sooner. But it's kind of hard when you're getting out of the water half an hour, 45 minutes faster than other people. People start to get concerned. It's important when we talk about decompression diving that we keep it within a reasonable zone. Okay, it's real easy to start talking about four and 500 foot dives not operating like 150 foot dive. Well, that's because they're not the same thing. We're going to talk about 50 to 150 minutes of runtime in the 100 to 300 foot range. That's the average boat dive. The boat won't let you go longer than that. We typically don't dive deeper than 300 feet. And you need about 100 to get into deco. So that's the meat of the market. Okay. So does more deco stress equal safety? Loading more, coming up slower, does it equal safety? Are profiles with shorter run times and less deco stress reckless? You know what? There's no evidence to prove either way. There isn't. But the best part to all of this is what if you really weren't even diving what you think you're diving? That keeps coming up. 
So, if we set a specific gradient factor, but we only manage a 10 to 15 minute ascent, 10 to 15 foot per minute ascent to the first stop, would we still have the same GF? What is about the average ascent speed? No, that's what's required. What do you think is actually going on? Yeah. You know, you see it all the time in the forums, people saying, there's something wrong with my computer. I left the bottom with 50 minutes of deco. I got to my first stop, and I have 80 minutes of deco. How'd that happen? Well, you loaded more. <laughs> Went up too slow, right? Where are the most important stops? Well, the most important are 30, 20, and 10, but don't get me wrong. Those deeper stops are needed too. But the last stop is that much I can definitely uh, advocate. Once your computer clears, staying a little longer, that's a great idea. If time and conditions allow you to stay longer, you should. So when it comes to an algorithm, algorithms are based on many averages. And a lot of people don't take these averages into account. Um, workload, thermal stress, physical fitness, stops, all are built into these models with certain standards. So an increased workload will increase gas loading at depth, kind of like you were talking about in terms of not so much your sack rate, but if you're, if you're working harder, you're right on, OK? So consider voluntarily adding decompression time on your last stop if you're diving really hard. How come? Does your computer know how hard you're working? No. <laughs> okay. And by the way, do you know what it allowed for for your work level to begin with? No. Could your fitness level be different than the person next to you? Could your dive from one day to the next have more current in it? Maybe you just suck that day. You can't make buoyancy. You're just working after that happens. Workload changes constantly. But you know what? As far as your computer is concerned and as far as your algorithm is concerned, it's perfect. It's the same thing all the time. You know why? It's a mathematical theoretical formula. It is not the human body. Okay. Thermal stress. Does temperature play a role in deco stress? Yeah, and there's some really good evidence to suggest that uh, colder temperatures do create a higher incident rate. Why do you think that might be? Yeah, it, it affects perfusion. So. I feel that diving in cold water is way too dangerous. I won't do it. Okay. You only last four in cold water. Yeah. Still, cold water is bad. Cold temperatures reduce perfusion and may lead to unearned hits. Does your dive forecaster or computer adjust your schedule for temperature? You know what? I think in the future there will be some type of a uh, a matrix added to that in some, at some point. I think it's going to take a lot of work before they can come up with that. But again, it's not taking into account. Uh, having a more efficient body allows for better perfusion. Studies suggest fitness to posit positively affect the risk of DCS. How fit do we need to be to have a positive effect on your profusion efficiency? Yep. Are you saying on what number of people, the more fit somebody is, the greater risk of DCS? That's, that's the way. Is that how that reads? No, so the positive effect. Positive effect. I just don't say it's wrong. Yeah, it's just between, because also your ability, when you're a super fit guy, your ability to perfuse your body, you might be pushing a lot more, a lot more. Yeah, I get where you're coming from, but definitely fitness plays a role. Um, you're going to 
have a better result for the, it's pretty broad, but it's reasonable to assume that the more efficient your body is, the better you're going to manage perfusion, okay? And, and, let, and, and yeah, and let's face it, in the dive industry, people think going diving is their exercise. <laughs> it's not, it's really not. And you, you need to read up a little bit on that one. So, and just because many people don't like this idea does not make it wrong, sorry. So, getting fit is important for many reasons in diving, not just DCS. So, you need to consider your workload, and we're gonna get into this deeper. Workload, thermal stress, physical fitness, Stop depth patterns, and we're not going to get into helium tonight. That's a whole other rabbit hole. Okay. That's it. Depends on who you talk to. Technically, yes. The interesting part is, you know, Bowman never finished helium, so we don't really have effective information on helium. So, yeah, I, you know what? The outside light, they got that out. So, that's the setup. This is the foundation that I wanted to give you so we could then talk about what we're here to talk about tonight. So, um, we're, we're making good on time. If you want to take a quick five minute break, um, but I am going to start.